don't like that they understand me. I'm a grind hard till I do damage. Ain't nothing out here handed. Why is loving myself so outlandish? Giving my people real chances to paint their story on the canvas. So thank you. Thank you guys for joining me today on my show, Dayana Camille TV. I'm super excited to have you guys here to talk about life after the gunshot. So um, I wanted to jump right into it. Give me a little background about how you got started on creating this documentary and what really inspired you. So I'll jump into it first. So um, Che and I were had a program at a, a local hospital and we had established a, a hospital violence intervention program where we worked directly with young black men who were survivors of firearm injuries, stabs, and assaults, and providing them with psychosocial services in the form of peer support, uh, mental health counseling, employment, you know, pro bono legal services, et cetera. And uh, we have formed really close relationships with many of the young men. And at the time, um, the hospital where we were working had a trauma recidivism rate of 32%, which means that, you know, at three out of every 10 young men that had been violently injured that were treated there. This was their second time or third or fourth time in their lives being treated for a violent injury. And so our primary aim was to reduce the trauma recidivism rate because it could reach up to 60%. And so that's why uh, we started engaging in the program, providing these services. And by the time we finished um, after two year period from 2017 to 2019, we uh, have worked with 116 young black men and uh, we only had one person come back for a violent injury. So if you do the math, it's almost less than 1%, um, considering that we started at 32% and it could reach out up to 60%, really showed the success of the program. And then we wanted to get their stories out to the world. And we decided that, you know, in the previous research studies that we had conducted, we always place our findings in peer reviewed articles and only scholars really get to see those articles. And we really wanted their stories to be illuminated to a broader audience across the world. And, and so when we started our next study with 10 young brothers who had been injured, we decided to film it and, it. and it resulted in what you're seeing right now. And I think, you know, you know, most people say, hey, you know, I've never seen 10 black men talk about their violent injuries on camera, right? You know, some people think this is impossible. Right, but because we had a relationship with them for two years, it was just like they were talking to us, you know, on a regular, you know what I mean? You know, we walk into those rooms and we see those guys bedside, like I said in the, in, in the film, they have no hope, you know what I mean? So it's our jobs to uplift them and get them in a space where they can articulate, you know, how they're feeling and what they're going through. You know what I mean? That's our number one measurable. You know what I mean? It's enrolling them in some type of mental health um, climate, because most black men don't articulate, you know, the way that they feel. Right. And that's why we believe gun violence is, you know, so high today is because guys are walking around with a chip on their shoulder, right? Walking around with, you know, this mental illness, illness, and, you know, they know nothing about it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when it comes down to, to counseling, you know, I mean, it's a black cloud, black cloud over black people's heads. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that, right? But people are sick. You know what I mean? These young men are sick, right? You have to be sick to, to, to point a gun at someone and take someone's life and don't feel any type of way about it. Okay. Help is help. People need help. Out of the 10 survivors that you guys interviewed, who made you the most vulnerable? What story stuck out to you the most? Um, for me, you know, God rest his soul, uh, Marge Powers, um, you know, we lost him about two years ago. And um, he was one of those kids that wanted to change his life. He was in the process of changing his life. You know, he just took a test to go to community college. I, wanted to, I think it was Montgomery Community College. You know, he was on his way. So that's the story that I think, you know, sticks out, you know, in my heart. And I think it does that because just because we might want to change, we still got shit that we got to deal with in the streets. Yeah, you know I mean, we can't just erase our past. So we end up, you know, catching up with them. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. What about you, Dr. Richardson? For me, I would definitely say, you know, it was Marge 
um, because of where we started with him and watched him go through the whole process of getting, he got into college, he was starting at Montgomery Community College, and then he had just completed his certification in um, and vocational certification in carpentry for Run Hope Work. So shout out to uh, to, to my brother BJ Page who runs that program. And it was it was you know it was devastating to work with you know such a young promising king, and then you know his life just tragically is, is cut short. You know at the age of you know 20, 21 years old, and you know we had to go to his funeral and just you know see his body lying. And I think that's when you know we really realized like what we the work we do is life or death. It's it's for real. Like it could it, it could either you know save somebody's life or change somebody's life you know, where they end up in a situation where, you know, their life is just cut short. So, you know, unfortunately that happened to him and, um, you know, it struck me the day I was asked by BJ to, to give the keynote speech for his graduation when he wasn't there. And I, I was asked to do that and Che was asked to do that because, you know, we were so close with him. So I would definitely say, you know, everything that we do in terms of this, this production, we always keep him in mind as the driving force and spiritual guide that's looking over the work that we're doing. When we're talking about that and experiencing that trauma for yourself, uh, what message do you want to get across to young people? What is the main message that you want to get across to them? It's a couple of things, right? The first thing is help is help. Everyone needs help in their lifetime. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. Don't be ashamed to, 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 to go to someone and say, mentally, I'm just all, I'm just not here. I think that people in general need to understand that when you fall, you gotta get up. And the only way that you can heal yourself is acknowledging that you that you fail and actually going to talk to somebody about it. Right? I think people get so wrapped up in that, I'm gonna talk to my best friend or I'm gonna talk to my mother, I'm gonna talk to my father. They dealing with their own trauma. No you understand what I'm saying? So I don't believe that sick people can help sick people. You know what I mean? I believe that you have to deal with someone that's in the non, in the non vulnerable point where you say, "Look, man, you don't know me. I don't know you, but let's sit down and have a conversation." You know what I mean? So that's the first thing. You know, help is help. The second thing is, I believe that you can accomplish anything that you want to accomplish in life. I think once you set your mind up, that's it. You just go with it. You know what I mean? I use this quote all the time. Will Smith said it the best. Greatness is not this esoteric life form. It's within all of us. We just got to tap into it. We just got to focus. You know what I mean? You know, growing up in, you know, the urban communities, and I'm not, and I'm not speaking for everyone's household, but majority of people's household, parents uh, teach their kids, go to school, go to college, then go get a nine to five, right? right? And then you work this nine to five for 30 years, a job that you don't like, then you die. I don't really feel like that's living. Right. You know what I mean? And I think the most potential are in the graveyards. Think about how many young black kings are in the graveyards. Our next professors, our next president, our next surgeons, all because of what? You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's, that's, that's my perspective. Go ahead, Doc. You know, I want to take a quote from um, from one of our from one of our young kings who was on our previous show. Rose said, "You know, five seconds could get you get you a hundred years, and you know, it just takes like a split decision to you know totally alter your life. Whether you know, as Chase said, you're going to spend spend the rest of your life behind bars over a split decision, or you're not going to be here anymore." So, I think really what we want to get across to young people is like to you know take some time to just cool off for a little bit before you make the decision. And if you have the time, you have somebody that you can contact, you know, your OG or somebody that's even in your circle that has, you know, level-headed and has a rational mindset, you know, seek that person out, you know, to get advice because a lot of times we make really rash decisions that'll end up changing the course of our lives. And so many times we find like young brothers were in a situation and then look back and like, it didn't have to be like that. So, you know, don't, you know, don't wait until, you know, it's too, too long, dead, deep in the game 
you know, and made in an action that you can't take back. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, I was thinking about this morning, um, you know, what we really call the work that we do, if we could summarize it in, in something that sounds really like catchy. And I, and I, and I thought about, you know, the, the comeback is greater than the get back because we see, we see, we see kings who you may, you know, you may have assumed were falling, but they, they come back was way more amazing than if they just went and got the person back. And I just want to get that across to people like the comeback is greater than the get back. You know, get your get back through your comeback. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to go and just get the person back and just alter your life, that person's life, their family's lives. But you know, focus on you, focus on your comeback, and that'll be your get back. So that's that's ultimately what I want to get across to young people that are watching, you know, what's going on right now, because the streets really don't love you. You know what I mean? That's real. You see a lot of young brothers come up in a trauma unit and sitting up in the bed and been hit up multiple times and never see any of their friends come visit them. And, and so, you know, the streets don't, the streets don't love you like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, talk to me a little bit about um, what it's like you going into those trauma units and experiencing that for yourself. You know, doing that countless times with the survivors and things like, you know, experiencing that, how is that on your mental health? Well, let me say this. <clears throat> I think the way me and Dr. Richardson dealt with it when we were in the trauma base and in the hospital, we turned the happy hour, right? We, we were drinking a lot. We were drinking a hell of a lot, you know what I mean? We seen kids come in there, you know what I mean, dead. We seen young kings come in there, dead. You know what I mean? We was in the operating rooms. We notified the, the, the next of kin that their son or husband or boyfriend might not make it. And I think it took a lot out of us, honestly. I believe that we walked in there with compassion and love and driven, but we walked out with our souls dead because it was just a lot of grief. You know what I mean? It's hard to articulate even now without getting into that space where you want to cry. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or you want to go punch a wall. You know what I mean? Because we've seen a lot of people die. So you experienced yeah. a lot of anger with witnessing all that trauma. As as Che mentioned, you know, we can't separate ourselves from the climate and environment that we're in. So we also take on the same energy of the environment that we're in and we become products of it to a certain extent. So we also at certain points suffer from trauma. I think a lot of people don't get that yeah. for um, frontline. And, I'm, and when I'm saying frontline, I mean from the trauma surgeons to the nurses, to the violence interrupters, to the work that we do, like on the front lines all the time, it's, it's comparable to being in a war. And I think if you got anything from the documentary Theories. That's what we're trying to emphasize. Like this warlike conditions. We watch people come in, you know, every day, shot, stabbed up. I mean, we treated 745 victims of violent injury a year. That's like two, two a day. Sometimes you may get five a day. It's interesting. I just had a, one of my colleagues who texted me, who was a trauma surgeon, and said she's in Chicago. She said last night there were 12 GSWs that came in on one shift and two died, and she's operating on them. Like that's. That's the level of volume that we see when we're working in that environment all the time. So it, it has an impact on us too. And, you know, sometimes you, we, were, we spend our time in happy hours, you know, trying to self-medicate our pain in the same way that guys we work with, which really wasn't unhealthy because we're taking on the energy of every single person that we work with. And it's, and it's Che and I doing that. Right. So it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with and a lot to cope with, but, I would emphasize anybody that works in that space that they should also, you know, seek therapy and counseling too, because they need it in order to have a healthy quality of life. And I think that to kind of close this, close that question out, mm -hmm. you know, when we came up with the structure of the program, we never thought about how the volume in the program would affect us personally. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was hit 13 times and I was taken to the same hospital that, you know, I, I worked at, you know what I mean? 
So I'm walking into the same room where I was laying at bleeding. You understand what I'm saying? We just ain't think about it. You know, we were so wrapped up in trying to get, you know, the program up and running. You know, we totally, you know, devalue that perspective. And when it hits you, it hits you hard. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Can you elaborate just a little bit more on what it was like for your family experiencing that trauma? What did they go through? Um, my family. My family was on high alert. You know what I mean? I remember sitting in the hospital bed and I remember, you know, cousins and, 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 and friends, you know, coming up to the hospital, just sitting with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not knowing if someone was going to come and try to, you know, finish me off. Not knowing if, you know, when I'm being released from the hospital, a cop might pull up and shoot the whole cop. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think my family was traumatized just like I was. You know what I mean? Um, I remember a lot of times where they wouldn't allow me or they didn't want me to go back to, you know, the certain neighborhoods that I grew up in or just want me outside in general. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think they were scared that number one, you know, they knew I was on high alert. They knew I felt violated. They knew that I was on some revenge. You know what I mean? And they didn't want me to go out and screw up my life. Right. You know what I mean? Because of what someone else did um, to kind of, so to answer your question, they were just as traumatized as I was. Um, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Wow. That's a great question, because that's, that's the kind of question I would ask, um, and now it's being asked to me. Um, I would tell myself not to have any fear about what I really wanted to do in life and pursue it, because I think so many times we we fall into what people think we should do or the image of what we think we should do. And, um, and I think you, I would tell myself, chase whatever I'm very passionate about and invest my time and energy and effort. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because that's the other thing that's going to come on in life. People call it an L and a loss, but I call it a lesson every, every, Every L is a lesson. It's not a law. So learn from learn from every time, you know, you get knocked down and just, you know, keep moving. That's the key in life. You got to keep moving forward. Whether you run, you crawl, or, you know, you walk, just keep moving ahead, you know, at, at your own pace. And sometimes you're going to go fast. Sometimes you're going to go slow. Sometimes it's going to seem like you're not really moving at all, but you are. And just always keep moving and moving forward and keep focused on, on the goals. And don't worry about what people think. Because ultimately that that really, you know, shapes whether people are going to achieve a goal or not, because they're so worried about what somebody else is thinks that they can't really sink into what's good for themselves. So, you know, don't worry about what the next man is thinking or the next man is doing. I have nothing to do with you or your story. So, you know, I would I would say that to my 18 year old self. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. And Chad, I, I'm gonna let you go ahead before we um, before we close out. Um, I would tell myself at 18, there's no reason for having a plan B because it takes away from plan A. I think, you know, to elaborate on what Dr. Richardson was saying was make a decision and achieve your goal regardless. regardless. You know what I mean? Understanding that people are not gonna support you. You're gonna to have to make some hard decisions. You might get knocked up, but you get back up. Get back up. Get back yeah, regardless, you know what I mean? I think that if you have that mindset, you know, success is right around the corner for you. You know what I mean? And I would also tell myself that, you know, respect the process, love the journey. Like I love my journey. All this shit that I've been through, you know what I mean? I love it because number one, it, it, it gave me my morals and principles. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't take anything away from it. It was hard, don't get me wrong, but you know, I think it made me into the person that I am today. Thank you, thank you for answering that. Now I wanna make sure that everybody know uh, where to follow you guys, um, you know, on your either your personal accounts and also to follow Life After The Gunshot Instagram page and website, but can you plug in your Instagrams really quickly? Yeah, you can uh, follow me on Instagram at doc, D-O-C-J-O-R-I-C-H, doc Joe Rich. 
And again, you wear life after the gunshot as well on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, I'm bullets underscore with underscore no underscore name. That's bullets with no name. I'm on IG. Follow me on Facebook at Che Bulla. Uh, make sure you follow our Life After the Gunshot page on IG. Everybody's waiting for this episode two. It's right around the corner. We hope you guys enjoyed episode one. We love the support. And um, keep moving forward. Salute to DC. Yeah, salute to DC, salute to PG, and salute to everybody that has supported, you know, the movement from day one and everybody that has supported the film. And we hope that, you know, everyone just stays engaged with the movement. And we got episode two coming soon. And, you know, it's four part doc series and at Netflix and at Hulu and at Crackle and at Amazon. It needs to be on a platform for the world to see. I think it deserves that. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you so much for even taking the time to sit down and talk to me, taking the time to be a part of my show and my platform. I just appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to interview you guys. And I really look forward for people to be able to see this interview and get the message across and really, you know, support you guys documentary as well.